Welcome everyone to today's webinar on what does justice look like to you? Mediation and restorative justice to address elder abuse. We are pleased today to be joined by our colleagues by the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse to co-host this webinar today. Just to briefly go over some housekeeping items before we start the webinar, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. We will be recording the session and it will be posted on both of our website organizations at EAPO and CNPA a few days after the webinar. We are joined with our ASL interpreters um, who will be on the screen during the presentation today. If you would like to make the images of those speakers, uh, ASL, including our panelists, larger during the introduction and conclusion of the session, you can drag the video frame to the left and that will make the images a lot larger. If you have a question during today's session, please post that in the question and answer box and we will be pleased to bring those up at the very end of the session. If you'd like to post a comment, please put that in the chat box. At the end of today's session, we would like your feedback. If you could provide a quick response to our um, evaluation survey, just to give us feedback on today's uh, session, as well as future webinar ideas um, that will help us plan to ensure that we meet your needs in the future. I do want to acknowledge that today is National Seniors Day. And it's also the International Day of Older Persons. Today, both CMPA and EAPO are recognizing these days to speak up and stop the abuse of older persons in Canada. Throughout today, we will be posting social media messages uh, to recognize both days. The theme for the International Day of Older Persons is digital equality for all ages. Today, let's bring awareness to the importance of digital inclusion for all. Before we get into our panel presentation, I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one that is based in honour and deep respect. The presentation today will first begin by looking at some key concepts of elder mediation and restorative justice, looking at similarities and differences, and also the implications for training and the skills and competencies required to be a mediator, and then review some of the best practices that are existing in communities across Canada that are working well. And looking at Nova Scotia as an example of restorative justice in the justice system, and then also looking at understanding and addressing some of the systemic issues that do arise when we're doing mediation beyond just the family dynamics uh, and conflict that might be happening within an older person's lives. And then we're going to look at it from a national international level, looking from a wider lens to look at some of the considerations and what is being done um, across countries. And then we'll conclude by having our question and answer period. We'll be having our panel, um, everyone will be on screen, and uh, we will be facilitated by um, a Benedict from the CNPA. Just to give individuals an or, uh, a review of Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario's mission, and, and our mission is to ensure that all seniors are free from abuse and have a strong voice and feel respected. We do that through our action of raising awareness, delivering education and training, and work collaboratively with like-minded organizations to assist in the coordination and advocacy of elder abuse. CNPA connects people and organizations and fosters the exchange of reliable information, advances program and policy development on issues related to the preventing, preventing abuse of older persons working with local, provincial, regional, territorial, and national levels. CMPA has partners, um, as I indicated, uh, across all jurisdictions. They are the national hub for elder abuse information and resources. The vision of the organization ensure that we work towards a Canadian society where all older adults are valued, respected, and live free from abuse. So welcome, and we are so pleased to be co-hosting again today with the organization. 
I just now would like to introduce our panel of experts today. I'll start with Joan Braun, who's a mediator and assistant and professor at the Bor Alaskan Faculty of Law at Lakehead University. She is also resides um, in British Columbia as well, and um, has does mediation there. And then her colleague, um, Vivian uh, Carini, who's also a lawyer and mediator um, in Vancouver, BC. We're also joined by Jennifer Lilden, from, who's a professor of law, a chair in restorative justice and director of Restorative Research Innovation and Education Lab at Dalhousie uh, in Nova Scotia. And then we are joined by uh, Risa Eason from Ontario, and she is the um, director of the Marathon Mediation. And lastly, with Judy Berenger, who's an education counselor, mediator, and author, vice president of the Seniors Nova Scotia. Newfoundland um, and the president of the Family Mediation Canada and the past president of the Elder, Medi or Elder Mediation and International Network. So welcome to our panelists. We're so pleased that you're able to join with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Benedict, to facilitate today's discussion. Great. So uh, we were going over the differences uh, uh, of, between elder mediation and restorative justice. And Joan, you mentioned um, that elder mediation could be a tool for prevention of elder abuse, but that it, I think you mentioned it might not always be um, ideal if the mediator does not always have an aging and abuse lens, or at least I, I remember we, we briefly talked about this beforehand. Um, so I'll turn to Vivian now. Um, can you um, talk a little bit about the implications for training, what this means for mediators? Are they currently all trained to address elder abuse matters? Uh, how does that work? And don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm unmuted. Um, I, I think it requires um, unique uh, training um, from other areas of, of uh, mediation, uh, especially if you're looking at family mediation where you're looking at a husband and wife. Um, it, here you're looking quite often as, at uh, the older adult and one of their children. So they have to be able to examine the power differential between the two of them and uh, become familiar with the dynamics that occur in elder abuse. They of course need to be familiar with um, the aging process and the issues associated with aging, uh, so that when they're trying to recognize the signs of, a, uh, of abuse, they have the uh, added knowledge of what they're looking for or what they're seeing in terms of the person and how they present. Uh, there's different types of abuse that they would need to become familiar with. And, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, there's no screening tool um, available for abuse. So, um, you know, the best bet is that they would need to look at their pre-mediation um, with a great deal of curiosity and look at the questions that they're asking to ensure that they're getting the answers that they need to determine if there is any type of abuse. And this sounds already pretty tricky, but I assume, you know, the everything we look at these days, we look at it with also the COVID perspective now, which adds that extra layer of complexity. So it, there's one thing about being in a room with someone and being able to ask questions and get a feel, a, a tangible feel for things. It's another matter when you're dealing with something like this on Zoom, I assume. Um, and Risa, I think you have, I mean, all of you, I'm sure had a lot of practice this past year. But Risa, I think you said that you had some positive experiences doing mediating through Zoom. I, I have because in some ways that people aren't in the same room and shouldn't be brought in the same room before there's real preparation for that kind of meeting. Um, Zoom pr provides a distance and it provides a, a safety and a security because you're not in the room with the person face to face. And I think just to add to what Vivian was saying is to, to back up in terms of, you know, what's the, what's, what are the principles for elder mediation, especially when there's abuse involved? And, you know, when you talk about being a person-centered mediator, that's to say that the voice of the older person is, is paramount. So how do you as a mediator 
develop a relationship with that older person. And I think mediation can give you a really good opportunity if you practice from a person-centered perspective, which really means you're talking about what's important to the older person. What are their desires, their wishes, their fears, their concerns, as opposed to often the concerns that their children are bringing forward, that there is a suspicion of, of abuse, there is something going on. And so again, developing relationship with people in the family so that you can, you can help them trust that you're going to be uh, you're not going to be judgmental, you're not going to be critical, but you are going to try to be helpful to understand what everybody's needs and and desires are beyond what they're saying, you know, their position is. So I think in the training, people really need to feel very confident that they understand that, that, that this is a person-centered process. And that allows you to have the individual contact with the older person. And, and in Zoom, it's tricky because a lot of older people feel very nervous about using technology, but I'm not quite as old as that, but I'm old. So I feel it's really tricky too. <laughs> so we have to set up a scenario where it's comfortable. And often if, um, if an older person is in a residence or they're in a care facility, you can enlist staff who they feel trusting to help them set it up and, and be on screen. And I would say the majority of the time when I've kind of gone that distance to really plan it and prepare it, um, the older person has been very grateful. Like this is, this is a new experience for them. They don't have any uh, memory of doing something like this before. And, and I've had people say, you know, commenting like, that was really interesting. You know, like I want to do this again because somebody's finally just really wanting to talk to them and hear what's going on. So the person-centered approach really grounds me in a sense of, you know, I want to find out what's important to the older person and what's important for the other people because they'll say they want safety and the older person will say, I'm not concerned about that. My son's living in the basement. He looks after me, but the sibling knows that he's, you know, he's attacking her bank account. So, you know, there are so many dynamics at play. And I think the mediator has to be very, very um, clear about getting people's trust. Which sounds like it would be challenging, particularly if you also have to do an IT support on the <laughs> in the back end. Uh, yeah. And I really think, yeah, challenges, technology, um, that happens at all ages. Yeah. We are proof. Um, <laughs> I'd like to add a little bit there. Uh, yeah. What Risa was saying, I think is so very important, that whole person-centered model. And I think because it's so much about dignity and respect for everyone in the room. And I think going back to what Vivian was saying, it's about really every moment throughout the whole process from the beginning conversation to the very end is watching, observing, looking all of the time, listening for the words, the language people are using, always assessing, is there any risk here? Always assessing every minute, it's a responsibility. And even though we have endless kinds of assessment tools around. As elder mediators, we haven't taken one yet at this point in time. There's people who have uh, developed some really great ideas for questions, but there's some you know, wonderful uh, questions people can ask from the very beginning that are comfortable, that are safe, and that aren't putting people in the field like they're going through a, a, a big interview. Mm -hmm. You are, you are muted. So, Benedict, the other thing, just to bring in what everybody's been saying so far, is that it's an incredible opportunity to actually build a safety plan. Okay. Because a lot of elder abuse is not reported for fear of what 
is going to happen to the family and and no older person wants to put themselves in jeopardy that they're going to lose a relationship that they're dependent on or cause more conflict you know people often say i just want everything to be peaceful mm -hmm. so even if there's something going on mediation can be such an incredible kind of safety net so that you're not necessarily assessing and mediating the abuse so we're not there to be judges and juries and you know to assessors of whether this abuse is happening and in this way i think at that point any cases that i've done where there's actually been elder abuse identified is there's a lawyer involved you know the the older person has counsel and that's a very important thing if they're really going to take this further in a in a legal way um but you without having to mediate and and in fact repel the person who may be doing the abusing you're really saying let's just bring everybody together to build the best plan for mom or for dad and we can have safety in our minds for sure because you know you can you can think about different ways to negotiate the son in the basement but it's really hard to negotiate you know saying to him you're doing this to your mother and therefore x y or z mm -hmm. that's not going to work for him but it's not going to work for her either yeah that's an important distinction and i the questions that i'm i meant to ask earlier were was in regard to reluctance i i assume you've all encountered situations where one or more of the parties were reluctant to initially engage in this process for a variety of reasons some of them you you listed earlier um is there a, anything to be said about um, how you make that happen? Once again, uh, matters of skills and competencies or as well as best practices that have proven successful for this. I'll start with Joan. I see you raise yeah. your hand. <laughs> yeah, so it just I just wanted to add a little comment to what Risa said about older adults being reluctant. And Risa was focusing on how that plays out in elder mediation because they don't want to make an issue. I just want to say the restorative justice a process that I mentioned, the mm -hmm. pilot project that was developed in Waterloo. In that particular case, it was a program that was developed after there was disclosure because these cases were coming to the police. But um, the people that worked in the field discovered that nonetheless, the older adults still didn't want to go forward for the same reasons that Risa so uh, well articulated. Those are the relationships with uh, family members that they care about. They wanted the situation to stop the abuse the older adults did, but they didn't want to walk through the criminal justice system. So that program was developed to address um, something that was slightly further in this um, down the road than what Risa was developing, uh, saying not when it hasn't been disclosed, but it had been disclosed and still there needed to be a way to um, create a safety plan and create a way forward that um, was less intrusive than the justice system. So, uh, so that was the reason for developing that restorative justice program. So I think that wherever it is kind of on the continuum of disclosure, or, you know, having been brought to attention, et cetera, there can be some discomfort for the older adult because of the relationships that are so valuable. So mediation or restorative justice um, provides a mechanism for dealing with some of those issues. And um, I, I know, Benedict, you were asking a question about tools and strategies. So um, just to loop back, that's where we were before I popped in this bit about restorative justice. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I think we haven't uh, heard from you yet. Uh, I was wondering if you had something um, to say about this topic, where I, we are just heading in a direction of talking about the justice system and how the, these processes, the justice system work together or don't work together. And I think Nova Scotia has a very specific uh, um, experience with this now for quite a few years. But before we get to that, um, the, did you have anything to add to, to Joan's comments? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting to me because, and I don't want to disrupt the, the distinction that Joan offered at the beginning, because I think it's helpful to know that there have been restorative justice programs developed uh, alongside or, or even embedded within the criminal justice system. 
that uh, that are oriented and very helpful to dealing with those harms when they do come to the attention of the criminal justice system. But maybe this is a bit of a prelude to, to talking about uh, Nova Scotia, but, but certainly here, um, one of the insights, the, the difference a restorative uh, approach makes in those contexts is not merely that it's attached to the criminal justice system, but, but that it insists or ought to insist at its core that these are relational issues and that people, that it is not just a matter of imagining harm between uh, the one individual who caused harm and the one who experienced harm, but that often the structures and the patterns of those harms rest in broader relationships. You've identified that as you talked about the other kids in the family and the neighbors and the support systems that the older adults may otherwise uh, have or not have. And, and in, uh, in Nova Scotia, we certainly have also seen this hesitancy to engage with the criminal justice system or even to engage in things that feel like uh, complaint-based processes or processes where they're going to have to negotiate or even mediate between, you know, in that interpersonal relationship space. And so a restorative approach there has also been taken to really create opportunities uh, to, to think about this in ways that is not necessarily connected to uh, the identification of, of harm, but surrounding needs um, in ways that can be proactive and preventative and gather together those communities of support within the family and beyond the family. And so we've seen that be a, an entry point for older adults who may actually be experiencing harm or need help, but are able to step into those processes within their community that may ultimately get to their family or within their family when they're oriented around planning and needs um, as, as a way to, uh, to, um, to allow them to step into it in a positive forward-looking space where they don't have to uh, necessarily take on those backward looking uh, sort of painful aspects of the of the relationships as they've been and can invite other people to be part of that solution finding that expands their network of care and support. That's super important as well. I think this idea of expanding the network and having a, a stronger community around you is, is quite, quite crucial. So we mentioned Nova Scotia. The, there's been, I believe, a restorative justice program in place for now, is it six years or is it more? I, I... <laughs> so the restorative justice program started in Nova Scotia uh, quite some time ago, so in 1997. But for oh. for young for young okay. people, so you're not you're not completely wrong. And then on the uh, the intention was always um, uh, to uh, to think about restorative justice in the context of youth justice and young people, and then to expand. Uh, the offering of that to adults. And so they started to pilot that um, in 20, uh, around uh, early, early stages in some piloting in 2010, but it's certainly been around uh, now since 2016 in a, in a broader uh, rolled out way for adults. And so that means in, in Nova Scotia, we have a set of protocols and stakeholders across the criminal justice spectrum uh, that allow uh, cases to be referred to restorative justice processes uh, that are run and held by community-based agencies across our province. And they can uh, be referred at any stage of the criminal justice process. So they can be referred by police um, in place of charges or following uh, charges as a response to charges. They can be uh, referred, of course, by the Crown. They can be referred um, by judges post um, as part of a sentencing process or informing a sentencing process. Um, and they can also be referred at later stages through corrections or alongside the criminal justice system by victim services. Um, and that's a new kind of um, uh, option that's sort of being de developed more robustly as we move uh, into adults and thinking about what would it mean uh, to uh, to actually um, center these restorative referrals around the victim rather than around the offender being uh, being referred. Um, so that means that when, and I think this is a big when for us, which we've acknowledged, when, when older adults have been uh, harmed and are willing to uh, be part of a criminal process, right, um, or where there have been charges laid and they're willing to participate uh, in, at all, uh, those can be handled through that restorative justice process. And, and those processes have the opportunity to really, um, within the framework of a restorative process, 
bring together those who uh, have been affected. So those who caused the harm with those who've been harmed in ways that are appropriate and safe, of course, but also to ask the question about who else, who else is involved in this, who else has responsibilities here, uh, who else can help. Uh, so that we create the opportunity to think in a future focused way, how are we going to understand the harm and address it and make a plan for the ways in which these relationships can be safe and healthy and good. And we know um, in when this is done well, the conversation allows space for asking what kind of collective responsibility we bear in society uh, in terms of re really specifically in a particular community around an older adult who was vulnerable and will continue to be vulnerable unless there are relationships of support and care and access to services. So how do we how do we problem solve that and ensure that that's part of the plan? That means it can't just be the person who caused the harm, uh, the immediate uh, harm uh, in the process, because they often um, are not the people that are most likely, we're most likely to turn to, to make a plan for a just way forward, a justice way forward. So that certainly those referrals are possible in Nova Scotia, partly based on this knowledge that um, the criminal justice uh, system can be re-traumatizing even with such referrals and is something that older adults avoid. Um, we have a senior safety uh, officer program here that has uh, is located, uh, funded through the Department of Seniors and is located um, uh, in and alongside uh, policing services. And, uh, and several years ago, sort of at the very beginning of even adult RJ uh, being available in the province, uh, several of those senior safety officers collaborated with local restorative justice agencies to imagine uh, what a restorative pathway would look like um, maybe before police referrals or in place of, of police uh, where charges were not sought by the older adult. And they very quickly saw the need to respond immediately where there's harm, but also saw the real need to look in proactive and preventative ways and to use these very same kinds of processes of a restorative approach to be building communities that are oriented to senior safety. Um, and so that's that's been quite powerful uh, in terms of watching the collaboration of systems. That's fantastic. And so now a few years in this this uh, this work, um, are there a couple of um, observations you can make, I guess, on the challenges and the successes of of putting something like this in place and seeing it through? Now, I think I mean the challenges are are are. Um, are many <laughs> and probably not surprising to people, right? Which is if you're trying to create a place and a space to uh, attend to and pay attention to relationships and to foster the kinds of relationships and conditions older adults need to be well and to be safe in community, um, that uh, the criminal justice system is a very difficult um, route to go to find that right? It's oriented around a story about harm that's focused on individuals who did bad things and breached the law. It's not that that isn't part of this story. It's that it, it's, uh, it's not all of this story. And it's sometimes a very painful, complex part of the story when you're related to those um, or dependent upon those who are causing that harm. And we don't have a great track record in the criminal justice system of making people better and less harmful. Um, and so um, I think there's a lot of hesitancy to trust going into that system and then to hope for a referral out. Um, and so we are really seeing that we need to be more attentive to creating uh, space so that people don't have to enter um, the criminal justice system um, and, and all of that, that entails that can be traumatic and harmful and doesn't address needs before they can have the option of, of responding restoratively. I think the uh, opportunities that have emerged are, are exactly uh, related to that, which is starting to really think about why we have to wait for harm to happen or why we can't focus on needs earlier uh, in terms of uh, bringing people together. And, and this is where I think there's this incredible overlap with some of the hopes and aspirations uh, that have for a long time driven uh, elder mediation, which is why, why wait for harm? Why not? Uh, be proactive in bringing people together, both at system levels and within communities to imagine safe and healthy communities for, for older adults, but also within care settings and within families so that they can actually um, where, understand where there is harm or understand where uh, there is need. 
Um, and I, so I think the opportunity has driven us to this system change. Maybe I'll just say that and stop, which is, you know, uh, a restorative approach looks at um, justice through the lens of just relationships and says that's not just about interpersonal relationships, that is also fundamentally about the structures and systems that we put in place that shape those relationships, that make healthy and safe relationships possible and, and feed those circumstances that put older adults at risk. And so we also need to be responding when we have the opportunity to, to be engage in elder mediation, to engage in restorative justice, and we learn these lessons that are systemic and structural, we need to be able to take that work further and into the community and ensure we're being proactive and preventative. That also takes this kind of collective action work that restorative processes are good for. And one example I just offer is um, the way the Long-Term Care Commission in Nova Scotia, in um, Ontario, in terms of their work, sought to actually hear first voice and to understand that. And they used a restorative approach in terms of inviting uh, older adults and those living in care to participate fully in a meaningful ways to share their experience. Um, and so we do have some examples of where that's happening at a systemic level. That's, that's great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, well, since you're mentioning the, uh, the Commission in Ontario, I wanted to ask our panelists from other parts of the country. We have Newfoundland, Ontario, and BC represented. Um, are, do you have perspectives to offer from where you are in the country? Something you wanted to highlight? Maybe let's start with the East. Let's start with Newfoundland. Um, I think I really like what Jennifer was saying about prevention, you know, and I think uh, a good segue into that in what uh, we'll be coming up talking about national and international is that there is a real focus on people who've been mediating for a long time to look at um, advertising and marketing through their communities with other groups who refer, but helping those people to re to understand that it doesn't have to be egregious cases going to, um, the, the cases could be very simple, mild. And I think a lot of times when people think that uh, sources like really models, like restorative justice, like elder mediation, if we exist only for abuse and neglect, which is so, so important. But the other side of it, the realities of elder abuse, I think uh, Risa and Joan mentioned a little bit there, about mostly the literature will tell you that abuse and neglect go unrecognized. That, that for the most part, the majority of cases, it'll go unrecognized. And that people who abuse often happen to be a person's children or their grandchildren, which comes along with that tremendous shame and all of that kind of thing. And then of course the caregiver stress um, and the caregiver burden and all of that, that, that will come into that and play a part, but the preventive nature, and I think, uh, Jennifer, you were starting to talk a little bit about that, the preventive nature, and I was thinking, what's some really good example that people could identify with here? And I think we all know of somebody in our families who move back home, like empty nest and then move back home. And, and some of the literature might refer to it as like boomerang, whatever. But if you are the parent, it's not boomerang, you have child, who wants to move back home, they're 40 years old, they just went through divorce or separation. Oh yes, come on in, we love you, you know your, your home, our home is always your home. But when they're involved with community who understand what elder mediation is, they would say, why don't you have a conversation with everybody, with your, your parents and your um, yourself and your partner, if there's a partner now, or the children, sometimes it's the children if it's been a divorce, sometimes it's just themselves. But it is a potential for financial issues, which financial is so, so big and, and preventive if they come to elder mediation would be, well, you know, I see that you're all coming together and you're going to move back as a family. And what are the plans? So simple, simple things like um, how are you going to do the um, are you going to be paying part of the rent or part of the heat or part of the grocery bill? Who's going to pick up the groceries? Because the common one that we get often is that people are coming in and the person who is living in the home, well, mom or dad are older, so they don't need all their money anyway. So they might go along for the groceries and put in everything they like. Or it might be simply, we don't like the same TV programs. All kinds of really basic things 
that can be the impetus, the catalyst for a whole lot more hurt and eventual rights to financial resources, all of that. But Jennifer, you triggered a, a wealth of <laughs> examples when you said that anyway. I'll leave it there. And I think, Risa, you had your, your hand up next. Am I muted? No. Um, so I, there are two things that are coming out of the discussion. One is that when you think about training, um, you know, how important it is for people to actually really understand family systems. And that it, it's kind of like an, an amoeba, you know, you push in one direction and it spreads out another place. Everybody's connected, even if there's two people involved in the abuse, for example, and the ripple effects of that. And so it, it brings me to, you know, so what kind of training do people really need around understanding family dynamics, understanding issues of aging, which I think, Joan, you talked about earlier and Vivian, and also to really think about in, in a family dynamic that abuse is really a very isolating process. So many, many people who will come to me as a mediator, the kids, for example, their big concern is that their parents being abused and they're being pre prevented from seeing that person or spending time with that person. They may have even been the power of attorney and siblings have gone and changed it so that they're no longer the power of attorney. So that leads me to who I think could be key referral sources, which are lawyers. So getting into the justice system at that point, so there's, there's some protection, but there's a lot of um, disappointment, I think, because when people finally say, I'm gonna get a lawyer, a, a sibling, or I'm gonna get a lawyer for my mom, they're often not met with really good alternatives about how to approach this. Lawyers kind of say, you know, yeah, you can try this and you can try that. But if we want to go full hog into the legal system, this is what it's going to take. And this is how much it's going to cost. So the people who are identifying abuse are, are really caught. They're caught in a, in, a, in a terrible, perfect storm of knowing that they really have concerns. They have to advocate on the part of their parent but they're being isolated from that parent. And when they finally go, even on the advice of somebody like me, a mediator, who's hoping that the entering the legal process there, not necessarily going through the whole process, but entering it there, will put some structure on it. And so, you know, how can we really support the lawyers to, to work with the restorative justice and facilitators and the mediators, because I think at the point of elder abuse, it really requires a team. There's no one person that's really going to be able to, you know, inspire this to, to shift and to change. You know, issues with elders often Im involve a team, a system, a support team. Judy talked about the plan. Um, so my ideal, in my ideal world, it's a combination of the relationship work and the authority of the legal work. And how can we, how can we really see each other as, as supports for ourselves as we're wading into very complex family dynamics and, and kind of intractable, some intractable things. And I would, I would, it's not true in Ontario. In fact, at one seminar I did, the chief police officer was saying, you know, we don't have anything, but if you suspect it, give me a call. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, it's that loose. So we really need to get on the heels of Nova Scotia and other places that actually have a process in place that can train lawyers and mediators to understand the complexities and to and have a process that people can actually flow through to some kind of resolution. And Joan and then Vivian, I see you both had your hands up. So Joan, you start. Go ahead. Yeah, it just seemed like a good place to uh, fit this in because it builds on something that uh, Judy said and Risa. So um, Judy mentioned that often 
it's hard or you don't know when you're in the elder mediation um, setting whether abuse has occurred or you know it's often very hidden in our society anyway so you may not know initially as a, a, a mediator and Risa was mentioning the need for um, training and to figure out what training was needed and the moment there's a shortage of training but some work has been done to identify what would be helpful because since abuse is hidden um, the mediator can run into a lot of ethical issues or not sure how to deal with situations. So there actually is a document which um, has been uploaded to the Google Drive about um, eight years ago. Some of the early uh, founders in the elder mediation field uh, worked together on a committee to develop some training objectives, which really set out what competencies and what some of the issues are that you run into in elder mediation. So I just wanted to flag that. And I also wanted to say that the Association on Conflict Resolution has a monthly professional development meeting, which is uh, just one hour a month. Uh, people discuss uh, various issues that arise in elder mediation, which includes abuse and other things. It's a free, um, free uh, attendance to the webinar um, and people to attend from the United States, Canada, and sometimes internationally. So if anyone's interested in going to the professional development group and exploring some issues further, just email, email me and I can add your name to the uh, list that advertises the meetings and where you'll find out the Zoom links. So that, that's free for anybody. So that's all I'll say. Um, over to the next person. Thank you, Joan. And uh, make sure to share your email address in the chat box along with the link to the document you were mentioning. Vivian, you're next. I was just going to say that it, 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 it all goes back to the individual rapport and relationship that you've established with that older person. If you want them to participate in something like uh, restorative justice, they need to have full confidence and full trust in you because they're airing their dirty laundry and that's something they're not willing to do. There's shame involved with, uh, you know, a relative, uh, more often than not a child, um, you know, having uh, stolen money from them. And then the other concern that um, I think exists is, is that a child um, who's probably an adult, um, you know, are, are they participating in a process like restorative justice to, to get away from perhaps having to deal with what they've done in the, in the justice system. Um, so are they really taking full responsibility and owning what they've done? And does it mean that they are going to restore the relationship with that person in the way that the elder person, uh, elder adult needs the relationship to be restored? Great, thank you. And Risa, I see you wanted to add a, an additional oh. comment or is that a residual hand? That was a residual hand, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I don't want to, I want to make sure that we don't go over time because it's already been an hour, but I wanted to hear a little bit from, from uh, uh, Judy as well, because something that uh, Risa, you said about needing a process in place that incorporates the justice system and the mediation world um, in a just based on the the Nova Scotia example, I think uh, Judy, you might have some uh, some observations on this because you're involved at the with the mediation organization at the Canadian level and at the international level as well. So please okay, go. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to integrate all of that what you talked about with me, and bear with me. Uh, yes, I, I'm involved with Family Mediation Canada. And they have um, an elder mediation committee and an elder mediation stream. And for the last 10 plus, probably longer than that years, they have a certification program that uh, an elder mediation international network as well. I'm involved with that one. And in that one, we have trainings every two years. So we've had 10 summits um, and we have the next one, November 1st and 2nd, and I'll put that in. And those are, uh, interest we uh, content that we think mediators wherever they are around the world will have some interest and be informed from and i guess if i look at the restorative justice piece i know that that even though lots of times in elder mediation it can be from a preventive on the continuum right on through to abuse and egregious issues and i realize in restorative justice like the circles are amazing with regard to the person who is harmed is, is there with the person who has harmed and anyone else and all of that around that. Whereas within elder mediation, the mediation will still go ahead, whether 
somebody who is the person who is doing the harm uh, wouldn't have to be there in the room if a person's calling they want the family involved and all of that but all of the wonderful elements that are part of restorative justice find their way certainly weaved into the elder mediation with regard to respect to dignity to inclusion to engagement to empowerment all of those kinds of collaborative and and problem solving i think we're pretty safe to say are in there and is very person-centered and uh, conversations conversation move to kind of ensuring there's balance to the degree that you can have balance and in a very preventive nature always thinking about those connections so when you think about um uh what i think as everybody's talking i'm trying to pull together some thoughts in my mind with regard to the national and the international what what does it have um in common so far and even within the provinces of canada we hear and i think what are the biggest challenges that came to my mind as i hear you talking and i think one of the biggest challenges uh that we have in common nationally and internationally and i haven't seen anybody who said oh no no that's not a problem is ageism and ageism is so big and um it's ageism it's um um, it's discriminatory, it's stereotypes, it's very much um, all of us looking and dealing with it and wishing that we were, we could aim for a world where everybody feels valued and respected. And that we certainly do that in our mediation sessions. It's creating a life when these people come into our sessions, we're not worried about age. It is not about age. And um, so it's visioning our little world within the sessions without ageism. And you know what? Um, uh, what an incredible, incredible thing can happen when we don't do those kinds of things. Because we all know how old would we be, everyone in this room, if we didn't know how old we are. Some would be very much younger, uh, biologically, chronologically, or psychologically. I thought I saw a name pop up: Olive Bryanton from Prince Edward Island, who is an exemplary kind. Uh, uh, model, I think, with regard to uh, helping antidotes to ageism, because I, I, if I read somewhere, I think that, uh, Olive, if you happen to be on the phone, my sister sent me an article that said you had received your doctorate. And I thought, oh, wow, go Olive. I didn't think, oh, wow, I wonder how old Olive is now. And I, I had the pleasure of living in Prince Edward Island and seeing the incredible work that Olive had done over a number of years. And this is why I think in, in uh, what we have common in international and, and nationally is very much about ageism and how can we change that? And how can we address the internalized kinds of ageism that's happening throughout with regard to caregiver burden, dependency, um, about people not complaining, the internalized, uh, are very much influenced, whether it's internationally or nationally, you'll hear it everywhere you go. All of you, some of you are nodding. You don't look your age. Well, how old are you supposed to look? Uh, my mother, people tell my mother that all the time. And I encourage her to say, I wonder how, what am I supposed to look like? Because it just depends where a person has come from. And, or you could pass for so much younger. Oh, gee whiz, you know, I've done this for 40 or 45 years. Wow, you don't look old enough to have done anything. You just were born 40 years ago. And, uh, and even what you're wearing, clothes and all that stuff, that's all over the world. That's all over Canada. That ageism stuff. There was even somebody at one of the work, at workshop at some point said, uh, I have to do a birthday card for somebody who just turned 90. What in the world am I going to say? like a beautiful person who's in the world and what am i gonna say oh my goodness like talk about internalized ageism and our language everywhere like that fragile a burden oh they're incapable no future shouldn't wear their hair a certain way shouldn't dress a particular way instead of what i think is elder mediators and restorative justice people all of that we're looking at people as strong as independent as tremendous potential, as uh, all possibilities. 
and uh, and not limiting them. And and in the themes, so ages, I mean, we could go on forever and a day with that, but the other two themes is around intergenerational dynamics. It has been uh, touched on a little bit, but a tremendous amount of, uh, of work around, of knowledge that we need to know around, around the trauma informed and around through the generations, the, um, it, it's, it's just pervasive um, in that. And also another theme that is both national, international, throughout Canada a lot we see are the resources that I won't go into uh, now because I think it was touched on a little bit, but like having strong resources in the community, knowing what we're doing, the seniors groups, the funeral homes, our physicians are one of our biggest referral. Lawyers are so important and important to be part of it, but also as referral and back and forth. And uh, so all the community resources, the counselors, psychi psychologists, all of that, we find that common as we go through the world, as we go through Canada, that there's there's got to be find a strong way of bridging those tremendous resources. How can we bridge that in a way? And the other thing with regard to tying up, uh, pulling together what we've been talking about with um, with elder abuse and the importance of elder mediation and elder mediators having a strong knowledge of abuse and neglect. Both Family Mediation Canada and the Elder Mediation International Network were very, very concerned about the issues of people mediating with abuse and neglect without any information. And over a period of the last four or five years, uh, we have worked diligently and like Trojans doing research all over the world. It was led by Mags Boucher and um, and then a number of us from each country, our, our um, people were reviewing the documents, sending in anything they have from their legislation, their legislation and their communities of what they say and, and uh, do about abuse and neglect. So we have a document now, uh, I will get it to you, um, that is actually officially going to be rolled out at our November 1st and 2nd summit. And in that document, it talks about um, the role of the elder mediator in safeguarding vulnerable adults. It talks about preventative measures and the importance of jurisdictional considerations. So we are, we are of course, assuming that all elder mediators adhere to and know the legislation where they live and wherever you are. In Canada, there's differences in every province. In the States, the differences, every state is like a little country sometimes. Throughout the world, even within countries, there's the same thing. Very, very different kinds of things. So part of it, we have to encourage people uh, with safeguarding vulnerable adults. Oh, it is so important. Um, and, and it's up to us. And this document has really clear, it has uh, ideas of examples of abuse, all of that. I'll put that save time. I'm going to put that in your, uh, I'll yes, send it to you. You can drop it in. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a very rousing final comment. Thank you. And I realize we've gone a little bit over time, but I wanted to let you finish. Now, um, I think we can move on to the Q&A because people are really, really um, resonating with what you've been saying today. Um, there's quite a few questions. So um, let me have a look. Well, one question actually to wanted to clarify first, what is the current definition of older person? Is it based on age, such as over 65? The answer is yes and no, depending on who you talk to and what services. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it can be anywhere between 55 and 60 and 65, um, which in itself it creates some lively conversations sometimes. I've been privy to a few. Um, one person wanted to know, how does one convince a reluctant family member, and we're talking about a person who is potentially doing the abuse, that mediation may help the relationship? And how do you get them to agree to participate? So um, who wants to take this one? Vivian, maybe? Sure. Um, the only way you can convince them is by talking to them, by maybe giving them examples of uh, situations where mediation has been successful in assisting the family. Um, mediation is a voluntary process. So if they don't uh, want to participate, um, there's really no way you can force them to participate. You can just simply talk to them and try and convince them 
um, and uh, ask them, you know, what it, what would it take for you to, you know, change your decision and try and make it happen. Great, thank you. Um, I see a comment from Suzette Montreuil. Hello, fellow board member of CNP as well, uh, who is in the Northwest Territories and uh, saying the RCMP is often called to intervene in elder abuse situations. They're allowed to refer the case to restorative justice before any legal measures are taken. Most elders do not want to pursue a legal route, so early referral could help with this. I guess it's not so much a question as a comment, but <laughs> if you, anyone has anything to add to this, I think um, that's... That's I think strange. it's an excellent, yeah, excellent, excellent. comment because most uh, areas do have a community people in the police, RCMP, whichever it happens to be in your community. And that person could be really honed into building their skills with regard to what it is we actually do so that people referred sooner than later. And to Vivian's, if, if people in the community are knowing, and especially your physician, because they, you go, to, people go to their physician from time to time, and the more they're rooted in and know, uh, people trust a referral. If somebody says their lawyer, they trust their physician, they trust or whoever they trust, if they refer, that can really change it. And, the, and certainly the police who better can I make a comment on, on um, resistance? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, is that okay? Yes. Uh, just following what Vivian said, you know, I think that's one of the skills and the strategies of a mediator who understands the family system because if you're meeting with people individually, for example, as you start to get involved, um, you don't need to convince the, the abuser or anybody who's resisting I think probably there would be something that, that would be in common. For example, you could ask the family, you know, is there a situation that, where you'd like to get more peace within family members or find something that the, the person who's resisting could relate to? And then what I often do is I invite them. You know, I've already started the process. And so my experience is that people who have resisted, but they know other people are talking, often feel like, oh, well, that's not, I want to get in there too. I have some things to say. That's one opportunity. But the other is, I think you're not inviting them to talk about the abuse. You're talking that, to them to invite them into the family conversation about whatever is going on. And I think, you know, the way you construct that letter or, or how you invite them can really be very motivating for somebody to say, I want to hear your point of view too. I want to hear what's going on for you. What's making you unhappy in this family? So again, that that's just a, I, I think that's the mediator's um, intention to, to reach out and without judgment and without saying, I'm reaching out to talk about what you did to your father, <laughs> because of course we know that's a non-starter. So those may be some other opportunities to involve a reluctant person. Great, thank you. Jennifer, I see you have your hand up as well. I was just gonna say one of the things I think that this makes us have to really stop and think about is what do we think the problem is here? So one of the weaknesses of the criminal justice system is it's oriented, it identifies the problem as the offender. Um, and that's the thing we're going to focus on, right, is the breach of the law and the harm, but the harm actually very quickly becomes secondary in terms of uh, really being able to center the needs of the older adult and really taking a broader look at whose responsibility is this. This is, I, I am not making the case that there is not individual responsibility here. I'm saying actually there often is. And if we're looking for solutions and we're looking for, for making people safe, there's also collective responsibility. So there's this worry I have about um, how we actually be, help people understand what the nature of the issue is. So if the RCMP shows up on the door, what you really want is them to be referring the matter, not because you can't get the the one who's responsible, but because there is need here. There is a public safety, there is a concern for safety that ought to be the public's concern. Uh, and that doesn't mean it has to happen in public, but it also means we have to be very wary of imagining that this is a private, personal, only within the family problem, right? And that the solutions lie only within the family because very often part of what makes it difficult for families to do right by one another 
is that they don't have access to resources or they don't have the help they need or that we are living in a society where older adults' needs are, or they're not being valued and they're not being met. And so somehow, um, and I think a restorative um, uh, process that is, is, is broader than, but, but not excluding the need for the family to work together, but can bring others into that conversation and can have the family look for other resources and others who are responsible has to be part of the solution here. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're kind of connecting with what you were saying about looking at the systemic uh, picture rather than just the individual, the family picture. Uh, Susan is asking, as we work towards national standards in long term care, would there be value in building in the need for restorative justice practices within a person centered model and building in legal responsibility for operators? Who wants yeah, that's absolutely. a very good question. <laughs> you know, absolutely. I would say absolutely. And and what the one could a short answer I'd make to that is when we do that. I think we should be taking a page out of what we've learned uh, about the really powerful difference that a restorative approach has made, for example, in schools, which is that it, it isn't just at the point of conflict or at the point of discipline or punishment or breach of rules where it's made the largest difference. It's made the largest difference if it informs the, the building and the building of expectations, the building of, of sort of just relations on the everyday. Um, and so making space for how do people enter those facilities? How do you work with families and share decision-making from the beginning? How are you transparent about what's happening? Actually creates faster opportunities to respond when things are going wrong or not going right before they have to wait till the point where they're at a complaint and there's already been harm and jeopardy caused to those who, who are in care. And so I think absolutely it's the right question to build it into uh, both the responsive and reactive policies and procedures, but also the proactive ones, also what structures our expectations and obligations around information sharing, transparency, um, uh, and working together uh, to really include support people uh, and, and care teams um, in ways that they can uh, center the older adult and their needs and their wishes and their, and their um, leadership in terms of, of their own care. Thank you. <clears throat> I see a question here that I will direct to uh, all of you, but uh, Judy, you've already said your piece on ageism, but I, I feel like uh, people really want to explore that further. How can we decrease and eliminate ageist attitudes so that we can reduce elder abuse? How do we include the school system, including um, creating education credits for senior involvement, support yeah. of older people in the community? Yeah. You know, what are solutions that you would suggest are Key. Well, I think the reality is we start in our own families and we look at times when there's comments made and we look at our extended families, we look at our workplace, our colleagues, our friends, and we look at the kind of comments that are sent uh, to us on the internet um, that uh, we look at what people are saying with regard to uh, uh, you're too old to do this. Look at Facebook, for example. And, and call it out, because I think some of it now is calling it out. Like one of the things on Facebook, it said it, it's a serious violation to single out individuals based on race, race ethnic, ethnicity, uh, national origin, religion, gender, sexual orientation, disability or disease, no mention of age. So what would you suggest by that? And, and we need to call it out. And people with ageist attitudes, of course, the research says people like that will age more quickly. And it's almost uh, somebody said it was like a, a prejudice of, against their future selves in a way. And those who with the most negative views of aging um, are spreading through the community, call it out, it call it out. And what happens with internalized is that people do believe some of it and they be, are alone more. And, um, and addressing it wherever it is. But I think it has to start in the schools is beautiful. But even before that, because there's amazing programs before in young children, young children, not even in school yet, who are in, in having intergenerational, having grandparent kind of relationships, going into long-term care homes that are, are sensitizing themselves to such incredible respect and, and, and think even in terms of, 
um, of poking fun. I find it one real area that we have to be strong. I have a friend a slash colleague who is an incredible human being, but how many times I've sent back jokes that he sent to me that I said, you know, this is really not very nice. You know, this is adding to the, so poking fun at someone based on a person's gender, that's sexism, you know, and poking fun jokes about a person's race. Well, we know we've all been through this and, and that's racism. And we know this through and through, but poking fun, joking about someone based on their age, that spotter for the greeting cards, for advertisements, for TV comedies, all of that. How do we call it out? We need to call it out the same way. It can happen to younger people, but we know it's happening a lot to older people because the focus is on older people. You ask any person who's 30 to 49, um, how old is old age? Well, actually, um, people who are in their 20s usually might say 40. but 30 to 49 might say, they'll say on average 69. Ask people 50 to 64, they believe old age starts at about 72. And then you ask people 65 plus, because I'm given that example, someone asked that question, what is old age? Old age begins at 74 if you're 65, but go to a 74 year old, majority of them will not feel like they're into old age. They'll say 90 or something older. I just find it a really interesting and actually affirming because when I ask that question to people, and it is important for me to ask that because they are not, it's not about age. It's about how old you believe and you feel and you are. And yes, we start to lose uh, some physical things may happen. Yes, but not always. And we don't know to whom, but we know that eventually people are living longer, more healthy. So it's about um, 30 years longer than, than our grandparents. And that, that's a lot of life. That's a lot of life. So how do we deal with it? To me, we start, we're each other. We find good friends and we don't base it on, on age. We find our, we can have really great friends at 95 or 100. We can have really great friends at 30 and 40. I think we have to call it out a lot more. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'll, one more question because I see them piling up and I know we can't get to all of them. Don't worry, we've written them down. We'll address them and we'll also share resources with you um, after this, uh, this webinar is over. Jamie from, I believe, New Brunswick is asking, how does mediation and restorative justice fit in with the adult protection process? Thank you. Um, let's see, who haven't I heard for a little while? <laughs> or who has knowledge of this? Um, I can give you the answer from, yes. from Nova Scotia, I think is where he asked. Um, so, so the adult protection um, uh, work is interesting in the sense that uh, there's space and place for a restorative approach, uh, certainly to be uh, used there. Um, and the senior safety group and the um, they started it called HASA, which was Healing Approaches to Senior Safety and Change to a Restorative Approach to Senior Safety over the, the course of their uh, work have developed uh, uh, some relationships with adult protection, particularly as those issues um, emerge um, first uh, to them and then have to involve adult protection. So often they can bring adult protection into uh, the restorative processes that they set up. One of the opportunities, and this was one of the other questions that the um, space to imagine victim uh, victim referrals, like so that you, you actually think about a restorative approach, not for the victim's participation in a referral of a criminal offender, but where there has been clear uh, victimization and harm, that could come to the attention of victim services here in justice or adult protection. Um, and so provides a place and a space for those referrals to, to increase in their number uh, in the future in Nova Scotia. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jennifer. 
Okay, it is 11.28 here in Vancouver. So I think, unfortunately, it is time to stop this very lively Q&A. Um, for you might be able to see on my screen, I hope you can see on my screen, the contact information for our speakers today. Uh, we'll be following up with all people who registered for this event so that you can get the recording as well as a list of the resources and the contact information. So don't worry if you didn't catch it right now. And I wanted to, uh, well, thank all of you. Thank uh, Rayanne at EAP for uh, managing to surf through the, the tech issues at the start. And before you all go, before you leave, um, Christine from EAPO wanted to tell you about the next webinar coming up um, that's going to be very soon. Christine, are you with us? Thank you so much, Benedict, and all our wonderful speakers. And also thank you to the people who've been con contributing in the chat boxes, who've been following those uh, insightful comments. So on behalf of my director, Rayanne, just wanted to let you know that on Tuesday, October the 5th at 1 p.m., we're, we're going to be talking about elder abuse and substance misuse. And you want to come to this because Marilyn White Campbell is a pioneer in substance misuse among older people. And you know how tricky it is, uh, some of you know this, when it, there's elder abuse and substance misuse going on at the same time. I just want to encourage you to sign up for our newsletters. You will never miss an event that way. Um, uh, mediation is a topic close to my heart. Uh, coming, I think coming in the middle of any situation to help people is such a beautiful privilege. And I'm reminded by the quote, you know, by Albert Einstein, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. So let's keep hoping for the opportunity to bring peace to bring some sort of a reduced harm or at least a new healthier, a healthier new normal to people's relationships. Thank you everyone from Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. Thank you, Christine. I hope you all have a wonderful International Day of Older Persons. I'm sure many more events to come to throughout the day. So uh, thank you all, Risa, Jennifer, Vivian, Judy, and Joan for your time today. It was wonderful to hear you speak. Um, thank you to our interpreters as well for always being on the ball. And we will talk to you very soon. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.